Uh, Mike Craven joins us now. Mike, the cover has been released for Dave Campbell's. Uh, this is not a, not a holiday. It's more like a feast day. If you like grew up Catholic I, like I did, every saint has a feast day. This is kind of a Texas feast day, isn't it, when you guys release the cover? Yeah, it's, it's nice. It's a, it's a fun day. Uh, it's nice to see the excitement out there. And for us, it, it allows us not to keep the secret anymore. You know, you just get asked that question so often by friends and coaches and, and people in the industry, and you have to just kind of like give them the run around. And now I can just kind of talk about the cover story. So that's always nice. So uh, my my uncle, uh, I grew up in a family full of Aggies. Uh, I'm not one, but uh, I, I guess I am by uh, by relation. But I talked to my uncle today, and he is of the old Aggie group that uh, he doesn't want to play Texas anymore. But then there's a whole group of well, this generation now of, of Aggie grads who never went to an a and Texas game when they were at school. And this is coming back in. The cover, certainly with Quinn Ewers and Connor Wigman on it, you know, kind of it celebrates the point that these teams are going to be playing again for the first time in over a decade. What is the buzz that you felt around talking to fan bases, coaches, administrators from these programs about this rivalry being back? Yeah, I mean, I think the buzz is high. I mean, just look at, you know, what is it, Friday night or Saturday night when Texas, Texas A&M played a baseball game in a, in a regional tournament. It was huge. That place was sold out. You know, all the fans are on Twitter talking about it, right? Like, it just, you know, I think college football at its core is a regional sport. And we've lost so much of that with conference realignment over the last 10 to 15 years, especially over the last three or four, that it's nice to have one of these back. You know, like, I think most of us grew up, even if you didn't grow up in a Texas or Texas A&M household, you had a favorite of these two teams. Like you had a rooting interest. You either identified with Texas or you identified with A&M or you hated one more than the other. Like you had a rooting interest. And so uh, for the state, I think it's important to have it back for the bragging rights, for the recruits. Uh, I think overall it's something that, yeah, sure. Some people don't, don't want it back for different reasons, but I think overall most people do. Yeah. I, I think um, I, I, I'm going to try to get credentialed to it. We'll see. I mean, like, I'm, I'm not going to be the only one who asks. I know that. So, um, but yeah, I, I grew up going to that game uh, quite often. It's a, it's, it's a fantastic, fantastic rivalry game. And we have, we're losing so many of them. And I, I don't think that, I don't think a lot of those, like, you know, we're not going to see Bedlam again um, for the foreseeable future. The last Bedlam was a year ago. I, I, I wonder how the college football uh, populace will feel about that when we have these years where those things are are, are gone now the the Pac-12 rivalries that are essentially dead and, and all of those things and trying to fit Stanford and Cal into the ACC and, and how weird that's going to be I wonder how they're going to feel about it and I wonder if um, how soon the administrators will feel that kind of regret when it comes to maybe people not watching some of these games as much as they thought they would yeah, I mean, I, this didn't fit into the cover story, but I, you know, I talked to R.C. Slocum about it. He was really close with with Darryl Royal, and he said towards the end of Darryl Royal's life, he was, you know, eating lunch with him, hanging out with him at his house, and he, you know, it was him, John David Crow, uh, Darryl Royal, and, and David Williams, and you know, they were kind of talking to Coach Royal about stuff, and you know, Slocum kind of mentioned like, isn't it going to be weird that you know Texas Texas A&M isn't going to play anymore? And, and Coach Royal leaned forward and was like, what? You know, like he couldn't even fathom that Texas and Texas A&M w weren't going to play. Like, it confused him. He had no idea, you know, how, how a reality of that, you know, could exist. And I, I think for a lot of us, it's been that way, right? Like, I grew up around the Texas program. My grandfather was the rehab specialist up there for UT. We did Thanksgiving the day before Thanksgiving my whole life because he wasn't going to be around. You know, like, it, that was just, like, part of our, you know, family fabric. And I think that's true everywhere, you know, like, if you're a Longhorn, you know Aggies. If you're an Aggie, you know Longhorns. If you're a Longhorn, how many Ole Miss alumni do you really like know and care about to talk trash with and stuff? And I, I think that was what was so great about the game. Like the Texas OU rivalry is a state rivalry with hatred. The Texas Texas A&M rivalry is a family rivalry between your uncle or your aunt or your brother or your dad, you know, depending on what side you're in. So I just think it's good for the fabric of football. I think it's it's a, it's a, it's going to show just kind of what what matters in this sport. And, and to me, that's always been the regional rivalries and the bragging rights and the trash talking of your friends and your family and and, and that, what comes with that. Mike, the uh, you know the, again, there's a lot of shakeups in Texas. It means the Big Twelve is going to be completely different. Uh, you know, SMU's now in a power conference in the ACC for however long that conference lasts. Um, after their court battles continue. But do you see this as, 
you know, with Texas on the on the upswing and, and playing in the playoff last year with, you know, uh, Tech looking like it has some positive momentum, even though they've been a little up and down with TCU a couple years ago. Like, this is – maybe all this is going to be good for the state of Texas overall, football-wise? It'll be it'll be interesting. You know, like the last couple of years, it, it feels like a team that's kind of come – not out of nowhere, but like, you know, you couldn't predict the TCU thing. You, you didn't predict the Baylor thing in, in 21. Um, to a lesser lesser extent, SNU's run last year, and just like if Texas could could get over the hump, there's always a really good or there's always a team we think is going to be really good that that ends up not being that great. There's always a, a team or two who we don't have huge expectations for that ends up being great. It's hard though. Like right now, I'm finishing up a book about the history of college football in the state, and you got to go back a long ways to find a national championship. Your national champion that's not Texas. Right, like it just—it's hard in this state with 13 schools and how big it is geography-wise um, to have a dominant team. Like it's not like Louisiana, where LSU kind of gets all the best players, and it's an insular state, and so they can really lean there. Ohio State with Ohio, Georgia with Georgia. Like Texas is big. Like you live in Dallas, you're as close to Oklahoma as you are at UT, right? You live in West Texas, you're not—you're not close to Houston, and so I think the size of it makes it hard, and it's hard to predict. Um, the state of Texas, but I would think in the AP poll that comes out that you know in first you know week one of the college football season, you know, Texas may be the only one ranked. I, I think it's it's kind of a kind of an odd year in the state where there's a lot more question marks than known if you look at each individual program. Let me uh, get your opinion on this since you're writing the history of this and going back, like you know Texas won in 2005. Before that, uh, it was in the 70s when they won. You know, so what, they went the entire decades of the 80s and 90s and didn't win a national title. Um, A&M had always had these teams that people thought like, oh, this is the year that Coach Slocum's going to break through. I remember one year they were ranked like third and they played Colorado on the road and Colorado just shredded them to death. And that was the kind of the end of, of the hope of, of them contending then. Do you think the Southwest Conference was too obsessed with with itself while other programs around the country, the Nebraska's and Miami's and Ohio State's and, and, and that were, they were obsessed with winning national titles as opposed to being the big dog in their own conference alone? Yeah, there's probably something to that. You know, like Texas is kind of its own, you know, we're, we're the America of the world, right? We kind of, we, we kind of think we're our own thing. Uh, you know, it's important to, build, to beat your neighbors. I, you know, just to speak of how regional it used to be, you know, my grandfather would talk about it. If they played Arkansas at home and they had a good year to where they made the Cotton Bowl, the Texas Longhorns didn't leave the state once for a road game at all, all year, right? They play every single game inside the state. So, you know, it's just different. It's just changed in that way. And, I, I, you know, you look back, you know, since World War II, the only programs to win a national championship are Texas and SMU, the two times in the 80s. And we could argue if those two national championships really count for SMU. And so I just, I just, you know, you look at the recruiting rankings, the top 50, the top 100 of each state, well, if you pick Ohio, you know, most of those guys are going to Ohio State. You pick Louisiana, most of those guys are going to LSU, right? I think Texas is one of those states that it's always been hard to concentrate the talent enough to go win at a national level because Tech gets their guys. TCU gets a couple guys. SMU gets a couple guys. A&M gets more. Texas gets more. Like, they're just so spread out that it's, it's felt hard to win at a national level, you know, except for those years that Texas hasn't really gone because A&M is down. Um, and so – um, it's just, uh, yeah, I just think the size of the state makes it, makes it hard for one team to kind of rise to the top and win national championships. What do you think about SMU as they embark on this AC? Do you think that they will be uh, a, a force to be reckoned with year one? I know they're, they're probably behind FSU, Clemson, maybe North, I don't know about North Carolina, but maybe North Carolina. But, but really, you look at a lot of teams coming back in the ACC, they, they stand a, a good shot to compete most of the year. Yeah, they're an interesting story. I mean, last year they were 11 and 0 against the G5 and 0 and 3 against the P4, and, and that includes a, a loss to Boston College in a bowl game that's now in their conference. And so, you know, they spent all off season kind of reinforcing the trenches. They brought in eight new defensive linemen, all of them for Power Four schools. They brought in three new offensive linemen, all from Power Four schools. Like they know they have to get better in the trenches. I think they have the seven on seven team to compete. It's just whether that offensive line and defensive line can make the jump from middleweight to heavyweight. If we, I like to divide these things in tiers. And so if tier one is Miami, Clemson, Florida State, I don't think that there's any reason SMU can't aspire to be kind of the king of tier two. Um, you know, and I think what's ironic about the SMU program is the thing that killed it, right? The thing that gave it the death penalty is the thing that's allowing it to kind of come out of its coma, and that's using NIL in the city of Dallas to kind of, you know, help attract talent um, with the transfer portal, 
with NIL, there's no reason SMU can't be a, a pretty solid contender uh, at the P4 level. Do you get the sense from SMU fans that uh, they're really hoping that Arkansas looks elsewhere uh, if they decide to move on from Sam Pittman than Arkansas native Rhett Lashley? Yeah, no doubt. You know, I, I think uh, just knowing SMU fans, they, they'd argue with you that that, that SMU job's a better job. Now, I, right? I, like, I I don't I don't debate. I'm not. I wouldn't even really debate them that far on that. Yeah, and that's how quickly this this can change, right? Like three years ago, that's insane. Like three years ago, the SMU coach leaves across town to go to TCU, right? Mm-hmm. Like much less to an SEC program. Um, but with NIL, with Dallas, with getting into the Power Four, with a route to the 12 team playoff, a little bit easier now. Uh, and the kind of money and support you're going to get. I mean, kind of, I mean, one of the offensive line transfers they added was an all SEC freshman team guy from Arkansas, like from the University of Arkansas. Um, so yeah, that's going to be uh, if it goes the way we think it will with Arkansas, and they're in a head coaching search. I think two schools in the state are going to have to look at that, and that's going to be SMU fans, and it's going to be UTSA fans. Of Baylor and TCU, both who missed bowl games last year, which one do you think will have the better resurgence this year? TCU. Uh, I just I like their roster more. What they did in the portal, you know, I think Josh Hoover's a, a pretty good quarterback. Um, I just I have no idea about Baylor. Um, that's not to say Baylor can't become an eight nine win team. I mean, they came off a two win team in twenty twenty and, and went and won twelve games. And so, like, it's not that I don't think Baylor has an upside. I, I just don't know what it is. Like, if if TCU went four and eight, I'd be completely shocked. If Baylor went four and eight, I don't know if I'd be all that surprised. But I also wouldn't be that surprised if you told me Baylor went eight and four. Like that's just one of those teams that's, that's really hard to kind of get a grasp on right now. Well, look, we we cover them on a daily basis, and I think everybody in this room and, and Craig and Smokey aren't here. We'd all go. We we don't know what's going to happen. Dave Aranda, I think, has checked all the boxes he needed to check for do this, improve this, go get this better, but. Like checking boxes is different than that's just step one, as opposed to applying it to on the field and seeing how that goes. Yeah, I mean, and to me, it's the offensive line, right? I, I know Baylor has some familiar faces there, but they weren't all that great the year before. Like, you know, they're going to have to, this, you know, Big 12 is quietly, maybe not quietly to people paying attention, but I think the national perception of the Big 12 is the old Mike Leach Big 12. And it's not that anymore. Like, it's a, it's a bloody you in the mouth Big 12 these days. And the, the physical, powerful offensive line running teams have, have floated to the top. You know, that was Baylor in 21. It was TCU in Kansas State 22. It was Texas uh, and Oklahoma State last year. Uh, with Baylor, I just I don't know if their offensive line can push guys around, can fully teams around. I think you need to do that in the Big 12 now. Dude. Mike, uh, how much more work do you have to do on the book? Uh, Friday is out. So we're okay. in the editing, kind of getting the designs back, seeing all the pages, making sure nothing looks silly, kind of, you know, fixing a couple of last cut lines and photos and stuff like that. So uh, at the finish line, I would not recommend building a magazine and a book at the same time. I probably, <laughs> probably did a, a bad job of planning that. Um, but, you know, we're going to, we're going to survive and get through. Well, when you write the sequel, you'll know. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Dude, uh, dude, I'm going to need a summer project on the next one, the spring thing. Uh, yeah, that's what's always, that's what's funny with my job is like all of my friends in the industry, like they're in their slow times. Like they're they're like napping, they're at the beach, like they're they're trying to figure out content ideas. And then I'm drowning over here. So you now hopefully we get through this week and uh, going to kind of see some clear skies ahead in June. Well, uh, well, Mike, uh, we do want you to come up here, uh, come up here with a book, and we'll do a whole segment on the book uh, sometime this summer. We'll get that, we'll get that done. We'll get you in studio so people can can see it and hear from you. And we'll talk solely about the book and and everything that's in it. Yeah, that'd be great. It's going to be out August. Um, pre orders start on Monday, so you know, start seeing those links and stuff like that. I, I got the cover uh, a few days ago. Uh, I'm pretty excited about it. It's my first one that I've done by myself, so uh, pretty pumped about it. I'm also nervous about it not selling, so I will take uh, any help uh, from y'all that I can get. I really appreciate that. Yeah, well, we got a chair right here in the studio for you, so. Uh, All right. Come on That's, up. I'm, I'm an, I live in Austin, so it's an easy easy drive for me. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Mike. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Mike Craven, uh, Dave Campbell's Texas football.